sorry for the delay. Just realized there was no link in my email, so I had to go searching for one. Um, anyways, so today we're going to talk about um, neuroethics and uh, go from Jeez. there. Guys, we're, about seven. Seven. we're about to get started, so just make sure mm -hmm. that you are on mute, please. Yep. Yeah. We're almost at 2,000 cases. Oh. <laughs> All right. We'll get it there in a minute. Yeah, I'll just set people to mute. Um, Dr. H, you can go ahead and get started. I think we're good. So right now it's saying I'm disabled and I can't screen share. Hmm. Okay, give me one second. Tanisha. Wait, I need to save. All right, Dr. H, I made you co-host, so maybe that will help. Okay. Yep, there it is. So, advocacy and competency through neuroethics, everyone. Yep, good. Hannah, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So what are we going to try to do really quickly in about an hour? We're going to talk about neuroethics. Um, we're going to talk about um, what this all means, how it relates to counseling, uh, and how it relates to some of our um, ethics and things like that. Um, you know, things along the lines of advocacy and competency specifically. Um, Neuroethics is not the um, biggest topic in, in the counseling world. You're going to find very little written about it. Um, it's not a new term, um, but it is a term that's kind of working its way into our practice and things like that. Um, I started reading about it four or five years ago and um, saw that it was being it's worked its way into psychiatry and some of psychology, but as far as is counseling, social work, marriage, and family, you wouldn't find very much about it. Um, and, and this comes out of a need to have ethical uh, codes and uh, ideas about ethics that relate to the brain, how the brain works, brain development, things like that. Um, if you looked at this from a medical model, you would see that this is what the medical model refers to as bioethics. Um, and, and so from a mental health wellness model, we would give it a different name um, and, and call it neuroethics. And the, the topic itself, um, it's probably about 20 years old now. It, it's not uh, new by any means. It, it's, um, kind of maybe of kind of worked out on and the general foundations of ethics is our brain is complex we are complex and anything that we do to manipulate the brain good or bad uh, falls under the heading of neuroethics and so i like this slide because it gives you a good demonstration of complex we are in our neurotransmitter system the thing that comes back to is that some of the neuron research is being um, utilized to come up with different models and things like that that relate to how we implement neuroscience research, how we do it. It's 
let me get the way. And, and, and more or less, it's one of those um, good slides that gives you an idea of, of what we've learned from neuroscience research over the last few years. And, and Poor just talks about the individual that's been traumatized and they only sense the world from three places, safety, danger, and life threat. Um, what neuroscience research and neuroethics would then say is then we would use practices and procedures that help work an individual back to this place of safe and out of danger and life threat. So, um, so what is neuroethics? Neuroethics has a lot of definitions. You know something is relatively new if no one has agreed on a definition. And so I'm gonna present you with a few definitions, um, some of the original definitions uh, and then some newer definitions. So one of the early people in neuroethics is William Sapphire. Um, basically Sapphire in 2002 said that neuroethics was the examination of what is right and wrong, good and bad, about the treatment of, perfection of, and welcome invasion or words of manipulation of the human brain. Um, that's one of those definitions to me. Um, Dr. H. That H. Yeah. Uh, we're not seeing your screen. Your screen went away. So that's, nope. I guess that happened when somebody came in. Yeah, it disappeared on us. All right, let me go back and reshare. There it is. Okay, yeah, I guess when somebody popped in, it went away. So sci-fi and, and the idea of, of what neuroethics is, this is one of the definitions that means nothing to me. It doesn't tell me anything specifically. It sounds very aspirational. Um, it sounds um, non-specific enough that I can't do anything with it. And so you'll see some other definitions that are a little bit more, you know, manipulate, I can't even talk this morning. We can manipulate them and get something out of them a little bit better. Um, from we have that is that how we deal with social issues of disease, morality, morality, lifestyle, and the philosophy of living informed by an understanding of what's of the underlying mechanisms of the, of the brain. So it's a little bit better, still not the greatest definition in the world. Uh, if you look at the Center for Neuroscience and Society at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, you'll see that they have their own definition. Uh, it's getting, this definition, I would say this, it gets a little bit more specific and basic around the idea of what it includes. Uh, clinical neuroscience, neurology, psychiatry, and psychopharmacology. And then basically understand things from cognitive neuroscience, affective, and, and, and other types. Um, basically, you will see that um, they refer to psychopharmacology quite a bit, um, and they will also refer to um, manipulation of the brain with implants. And, and so um, psychopharmacology has been around for a long time. Uh, manipulation of the brain with implants is much more of a, a newer thing and, and much more of a, a thing where uh, we've got some investigational trials about how we might manipulate the brain with uh, what I refer to as brain pacemakers and things like that, but they're still not mainstream uh, use or practices yet. Um, a, give, a good example of this, if you know who Michael J. Fox is, if you remember, he was in the a TV show back in the 80s and then back, uh, you know, 10 to 15 years ago, he came back to TV. Um, he has Parkinson's disease and one of the reasons why um, he was unable to continue to act is because his Parkinson's disease um, progressed so fast. And so uh, with, the, with the ability to use deep brain stimulation, um, he was able to have this process or procedure done, um, this pacemaker type system that works to shock the brain, um, basically allowed his Parkinson's disease to be more controlled and him to have kind of a resume function uh, that he didn't have before. And what happens there is the idea that um, Parkinson's disease is to increase the system in the brain coding uh, from the perspective of Parkinson's disease, all the scientists thought for years that the areas of the brain that produced acetylcholine had died. Well, um, newer research said, no, they didn't die. They just went to sleep. So deep brain stimulation wakes these areas up 
allows these areas to produce acetylcholine again and to restore different functioning. Um, so since I don't like anybody's definition, I came up with my more and a bit more what I would refer to as a counselor friendly. Uh, I think of neuroethics as a wide way, array of ethical issues emerging from different branches of basic neuroscience and clinical neuroscience. And it's raised by our growing understanding of the neural basis of behavior, personality, and consciousness. Um, that fits much more within my thinking uh, than, than some of the other uh, definitions that exist at the moment. So things to ponder um, about neuroscience and neuroethics. Um, you know, what are the risks and benefits of using some of the, the neuroscience techniques that are being used now? Um, just think about from the, the perspective of, um, think about courtroom testimony. Uh, should we be using our knowledge of neuroscience to predict behavior or to more or less assess behavior of whether it's right or wrong? Um, one of the other things would be, what's, what are the long-term side effects and consequences of doing anything to a developing brain. Since I work with children, this is one of the, the things that's really important for me. What uh, do we really know about medicating a brain that is developing? Um, and one of the other things is if we continue to manipulate the brain to bring it to within some kind of normal range, are we at a risk of of coming to this place of where everybody is basically the same, having this, this uh, society that's too homogeneous and there's not an in, enough individual difference. So if we bring in our ethical codes, um, all I, we can apply ethical codes to all branches of neuroethics. To me, uh, the ones that stick out the most are non-maleficence and, and the idea of go. avoiding uh, so I guess harm. we can go do it now. And then the other one would be beneficent. <laughs> uh, which would be, go ahead. I did though. <laughs> I keep hearing someone else. Yeah, guys, please mute yourselves. I can't figure out who it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, then beneficence, you know, the idea of doing something good, promoting something, doing things good. Um, and and that would benefit society, and so that would for me would be the um, the idea of of advocacy. If you look at um, if you look at the two branches of neuroethics, you will see that the two branches of neuroethics say there's one branch that says you should do nothing whatsoever um, to manipulate the brain, good or bad. And then the other branch of neuroethics, they say there are reasons to manipulate the brain. And the idea there would be to bring back some level of stable functioning to an individual. And I think that branch is a little bit more rational and reasonable to say to do it that way versus um, don't ever do anything to manipulate the brain. So you know, the, the part of the neuroethics uh, society that says don't do anything would be the part of the society that would say um, someone who is schizophrenic, if you do something to help them with their symptoms and their psychopharmacology, it, that part of it, then you're doing something that's detrimental. Uh, from mental health, we see that as the opposite. We see that as, um, as we're doing something to help stabilize them to restore function so that they might have a more normal or reasonable sense of normalcy in their life. And so, yeah, there's two different branches. There's one way on one side and one that's kind of in the middle. Um, and I stick more with the one that's in the middle because um, I just got muted. I unmuted you, sorry. Okay. That's all right. <laughs> um, anyway, so back to our code of ethics. Um, in our preamble, we have, we have five different things in the preamble. Uh, things that relate to me to specifically in neuroethics is enhancing human development throughout the lifespan. Trying to do something to help um, individuals uh, re return to a normal set of functioning or, or something like that. Um, and then the other thing is practicing in an ethical, competent manner. Uh, there's a lot of great neuroscience out there. 
Um, there's a lot of great neuroscience that has been applied to and developed into usable practice. There's a lot of neuroscience out there that is all data. Uh, there's been no real application of it. And just because you can read it and make sense of it doesn't mean you can easily apply it. So that's one of the things that, that I think about is there's, there's great information out there, but is it ethical to apply this information when it's never really been tested um, in a practice or procedure? Um, bringing in AMCA's code of ethics, um, very similar to ours in the idea of increasing knowledge of human behavior and understanding of themselves. Um, we treat individuals uh, with dignity and, and we're doing our best to protect uh, welfare of, of individuals. If you bring in social work code of ethics, you'll see very similar things. The idea of, of helping people in need, addressing social problems. Uh, if you bring in uh, other codes, you'll see human relationships are important. And then they're at the foundation, like with AMCA and with the ACA code of ethics, it's competence. And the idea um, of, are we doing things in our practice that we are competent to do? Bring in marriage and family, you'll see very similar things. And then bring in the APA psycho, um, psycho, psychological code of ethics and you'll see beneficence and non-maleficence as well. Um, so this is a, a good example of a neuroethics tree. This is not all inclusive. Uh, this is just a good understanding of what's in the tree right now. So within the title of neuroethics, you'll find neuroscience. And you'll see that neuroscience has two primary categories. There's the neuroscience that we use to understand. And then there's the neuroscience, neuroscience that we use to develop technology that may be used to um, monitor or manipulate or something like that. So uh, if you just look at the technology side of it, um, monitoring or making sense of things, uh, things like um, brain typing, um, things like uh, trans um, magnetic um, stimulation, deep brain stimulation, uh, use of PET scans and functional MRIs to depict a part of the brain that's functioning or not functioning. Um, things like a um, lot of research being done right now about uh, using PET scans and functional MRIs to depict um, the, the, the quote normal brain and the brain of a criminal. Um, and it's all so correlational and, and so not at the place right now of being used to the perspective of we can really use this and have concrete with it. Um, what I was talking about with Michael J. Fox, he had DBS. Um, that's the way we view neuroscience research to manipulate the brain. Um, if you look to the understanding um, side of it, that's more of the soft side of it, making sense of things. Um, we understand how a lot of things that we do in counseling work. What neuroscience research does is take it to a new level and help us understand it down to the, you know, to the brain region where it's occurring or to the neurotransmitter system of where that's being involved in it or something like that. Um, it's, it's what I think about neuroscience research and how it helps us within counseling is it helps confirm a lot of things that we already knew and give us um, a little bit more of that scientific um, piece that helps us um, say, well, you know, here we can point to the pathway that's doing this. So it gives us a little bit more of that, um, you know, we're doing what we should be doing, the accountability part of it. Um, and then uh, in that understanding part also would be uh, mentioned earlier, um, the idea of, of expert testimony in court. So criminal, um, criminal procedures and things like that. And the idea of a person who does these things is most likely this, um, personality makeup or this chemical makeup and he or she is um, responsible for his or her actions or not responsible for his or her actions. And so a lot of things within the neuroethics tree and it continues to grow. 
and here's some more of the technology side of it. Um, and the idea of what I was mentioning, like PET scans and functional MRIs and all of that, um, just many different layers to this and the idea of, of how we come to understand things and how we are actually adding to the layers of our evidence and getting it, getting it to the place somewhat of now being uh, much more of just um, a guess science and a more of an exact science. So think about competency and what does that mean for us as counselors? Uh, what does it mean to be a practicing counselor that is competent? Well, you know, we understand things. Um, we, we understand what we need to do to be competent. Um, we know how to um, pick out the, the, the procedures that are evidence-based. Uh, we know how to um, use ethical decision-making models to make sense of, of our conundrums and things like that. So um, if you put competency and advocacy together, you know, they play off of each other really well. Um, I like to pick out the codes of ethics about competency because they're about as gray as any of them um, in the idea of what does it really mean to be competent. So, you know, if you take a two-day training on um, DBT, um, are you competent um, or does it take much more? Uh, you know, with from my perspective and from the perspective of, of you know, counselor education, we would say it's going to take more than just training uh, to be competent. Uh, it's going to take practice, it's going to take supervision, and then some more training and some more practice and more supervision, and then you're going to be competent. Um, so what are our boundaries of competencies? Um, you can read the Code of Ethics just like I can. And in, in our competency uh, boundaries are, you know, more or less continue to expand as research expands. Um, one of the things that I think about under professional competency is new special areas of practice. This is where a lot of the new neuroscience research is coming in into new specialty areas. Um, continuously, some new procedure, some new practice um, being brought to the to forefront is based in a neuroscience procedure. If you look at a lot of the trauma models, especially complex trauma models, you'll see how deeply they are connected to neuroscience research. If you go back 20 or 30 years, think about EMDR um, as a new uh, specialty practice area and all the research that's been take, that's been done to bring it to the evidence-based uh, status that it has now. So those new practice areas um, are, 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 are the areas where we love to jump on. We see these things, we see these great articles about how this has worked and that has worked um, and think that we can quickly move into these practice areas without um, realizing what it really takes to be competent um, and how much training and supervision that it takes. I think about just our current situation and um, the, the coronavirus and how it's moved so many things from in-person to remote and how many individuals have had to uh, start teaching from an online perspective or doing telemental health. And I remember seeing some of the early conversations individuals were having around this, just going, well, how do I do this? And then, um, then people, you know, giving information, offering trainings and things like that. Uh, boards of licensures coming in and saying, well, we're gonna relax some of these rules and regulations but remember you're still accountable for this and that and you still have to worry about confidentiality and you still have to worry about those things so um, the current situation in the country has really pushed a lot of people into a new special area really quickly uh, and it's good that we've had a lot of good training out there to help with this um, and it's good that we've got support from colleagues within the profession that can you know be our consultants can be our um, can be our supervisors and things like that. But that new specialty area is one of those things where neuroethics really comes into because it's hard to find something new now that doesn't have some neuroscience tie. It's, it's been a hot topic for 10 years and it continues to grow. So 
competent. What do we do to be competent? Some of the things I've already said, be trained, practice, supervise. Um, we do this as educators. We're, we're in this place of helping individuals balance uh, their level of competency with how much they're practicing and how much more they need to get to a place where they feel competent. Um, if you look at NASW, you'll see some of the very similar areas of, of what it talks about competence and, and here talking about areas of, of interventions and techniques and being properly trained, um, emerging areas of practice um, where we should exercise judgment and take responsible steps of education, research, training, consultation, and supervision. So across codes of ethics, very much saying the same thing about new areas of practice. There's marriage and family code of ethics and development of new skills. And, and the idea of what is your scope of competence? Think about this, what, is, what are your specialty areas? What do your specialty areas, uh, what do you want them to be? And how long does it take to get there? We have backgrounds in counseling, um, clinical mental health counseling, which gives us a good general foundation. And then from there, uh, we have we have that goal of developing specialty areas, whether it may, may be trauma or couples work or addictions or something like that. It takes another level of training on top of everything else to get to that place of being competent. You'll see some of the same things within APA's code of ethics. New technologies, um, very similar to what you saw in uh, counseling and within social work. So some of the caution around neuroscience research. Um, if you look at some of the some of the writings about this, um, there's a disconnect ben, between what we actually know and what we uh, would like to know. Um, there's a disconnect between um, what uh, a research article says and how that can be practically applied, um, because neuroscience research. Sounds real good, looks real good, can always be easily translated into applied context, into applied practice. Um, you know, the idea of neuroimaging as a hard science is uh, it's actually far from being a hard science. Um, there are quite a few centers across the country that do neuroimaging just for diagnostic purposes, and we're talking about mental health diagnosis. Uh, the idea if you have a functional MRI or a PET scan uh, based on which areas of your brain are lit or lighting up under specific circumstances uh, becomes a diagnostic procedure for saying this part of the brain is too active, it means this. This part of the brain is not active enough, it means that. Um, those, those types of things are a long way from being 100% accurate and they sh they're not hard science yet. They're more of a soft science. Uh, they're very good confirmatory information, you know, um, symptoms, um, neuroscans, um, interviews with clients, uh, put all that together and you've got a really good picture of what's going on. But just that neural image of your brain is not enough yet to say because of this, this individual has this disorder. Um, the, the term itself, like I said, I've seen a few things written about it within counseling over the last couple of years. I know I've presented on it 10 or 15 times uh, at different conferences over the years. A few, I saw there was an article in Counseling Today a year or so ago about, uh, about neuroethics. Um, it, we don't see this in our code of ethics yet. We see some of the some of the aspects of it related to the code of ethics, but it's not made its way into, you know, we have codes of ethics about neuroscience yet. Um, so think about this from a supervisor's perspective. Um, are you, if your supervisee wants to do something, engage in a new practice, if you know nothing about that practice and don't have your own training, are you competent to supervise them? especially with, with all of the draw to all the different neuroethics um, topics like, you know, 
um, neurofeedback and, and, and things that are based in neuroscience research. You know, can you supervise something you have no experience with? Uh, or do you have to go into your own process then of, of becoming um, competent and learning something about it? Or is this a time when you refer someone out and say, this person would be a better supervisor for this practice than I? So let's bring it uh, or bring this around to our everyone's favorite topic, and that's research. Um, you know, the ideas of qualitative versus quantitative research. and it's not about good or bad. It's not about what's better or best. It's about how the two complement each other. The best quantitative study that gives you really good data and numbers is going to be made better if we can qualitatively give it some kind of realistic perspective and realistic application. Um, you know, you start off with correlating information. Um, uh, this part of the brain is is overactive when a person has bipolar disorder. And that's a correlation. You can't say bipolar disorder causes this part of the brain to be more active or this leads to that. It's not causation yet, but correlation and causation work well together. Correlation is where we start. We work towards this place of trying to figure out what causes it. Um, and then the whole idea of evidence-based so there's, uh, this is a continuum, you know, evidence-based practices are on one end, but there's a lot of other beneficial things in between. Now you work your way from no evidence in research to being evidence-informed, uh, to being evidence-based, and then kind of at that very end of the, the, the kind of the continuum would be being able to have a randomized clinical trial that actually demonstrates this leads to that. Um, think about it from the treatment strategies that we use with um, clients. We, we start off with, with evidence-informed practices and we work our way towards evidence-based practices. Think about um, the idea of the difference between developmentally appropriate treatment versus a manualized treatment. There's a lot of really good manualized treatments out there, but they're not developmentally appropriate or specific for four-year-olds. Uh, and so the idea of how do we take this information and make it useful for treat, treatment across a lifespan. Um, the idea of methodologies and unbiased analyses. Um, if you look at uh, a lot of the research out there that leads to evidence-based practices, uh, if you look at um, those who do meta-analyses, which are uh, looking at a lot of different studies together and the idea of seeing what the commonality of these are or what's the best to come out of a group of experiments and things like that. One of the things that you will see when someone does a meta-analysis or when they do a, what we would refer to as comparative effectiveness research, um, those, those types of studies in research have two different levels of checks. They have the first check that is the methodology check. You know, did the researchers use good research methodology? Um, if it passes that check and moves on to the next level of, of research, then one of the things that, that the um, researcher is going to look at, you know, where is the potential for bias in this analysis? Um, or is this double blind in the way that there's little likelihood of analysis, of, of bias within these analyses? So um, just to give you a good example of one of those things with sound methodology is, is uh, trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy has really sound methodology, but it has really biased analyses. And so when you look at the, the data that comes out of TFCBT, you'll find that there's only one study done over 20 years that has sound methodology and as at the same time is unbiased in its analysis. Um, that was done a long time ago with some comparative effectiveness research. Um, so advocacy, talked about advocacy in the beginning and the idea of we should want to do things that better society, that better our clients and to help them in a way that um, 
brings some sense of normalcy and stability to their life that improves their life. Um, we know within our code of ethics, there's quite a bit about advocacy. Uh, if we look through other codes of ethics, you'll see them in Amka's code of ethics also. Um, you'll see them in uh, social works code of ethics as well. And then you'll see them in marriage and family. And then you'll see them in psychology. So what I'll think about when I think about advocacy and becoming competent, one of the things that, that I think about um, when I think about neuroethics, neuroscience research, um, advocacy for the general public and our clients. And one of the best examples of this is the adverse childhood experiences data and studies. Um, these, the data that comes from the adverse childhood experiences uh, started off years ago. We were just talking about research. It started off uh, years ago as data being collected, uh, that being done and collected in an eating disorder clinic. Uh, it had nothing to do with adverse childhood experiences. If you, if you ever listen or read any of the original articles from um, Dr. Anda and Dr. Filetti and some of the others, Dr. Edwards and some of the original people that were involved in the ACES study, you'll, you'll find out that they said that um, stumbling across adverse childhood experiences was not intended. It was more or less, it started off as correlational information and the idea that um, adversity leads to other things later on in life. And so some of the original data that's been out now for 20 to 25 years, um, it's correlational data. Um, if, you, if you look at this slide about ACEs, you'll see the old questionnaire is on the left and the new questionnaire about adverse childhood experiences is actually on the, the right. Uh, so things that we've learned over the process of, uh, about ACEs, what might actually lead to an adverse childhood experience. Um, so basically this original data that came out of these eating disorder clinics, um, showed a relationship between uh, physical abuse, sexual abuse, uh, emotional abuse, and um, be being anorexic or bulimic or overweight in adulthood. So it was just a connection. They didn't know much about what was going on at that point in time, but it was enough, uh, it was a strong enough connection that, that more studies were done. Um, right now, uh, the adverse childhood experiences information. If you go to the CDC's website, you can look up the ACEs part of the website and see kind of that that history of adverse childhood experiences data and where we are now with it. And we're going to go through that as an example. Um, the um, adverse childhood experiences study collects data in five states every year, and basically you can look at the ACEs map and look at see where they're actually. Um, collecting data every year. The, uh, there are states that will not participate in adverse childhood experiences data collection, and there are some that didn't uh, participate for many years, but they are now. Um, one of the, um, the benefits of participating in this is, of course, grant money and things like that, but uh, one of the, the newer connections to adverse childhood experiences um, with some good sound data is um, adverse childhood experiences in child and adolescence and substance use disorders in adulthood. And so the idea of, you know, this trajectory that we could potentially stop this progression down this pathway before they actually got to the place of being um, addicted. So some of the, the many uh, things that have come out of the adverse childhood experiences, you'll see some of the things that are linked to adverse childhood experiences later in life. I won't read them, every one of them, uh, but you'll see things that relate to uh, physical health, mental health, um, chronic disease states, um, suicide. You'll see things relating to, to things like uh, educational attainment and uh, academic achievement and financial stress, work-related performance. Um, Basically, what, what's come out of all of the data that's been collected over the last 20 years and, and the quality of the data is when an individual has experienced multiple adverse childhood experiences, their 
their uh, their uh, control pyramid or how we control ourselves once we developed is flipped. On the left, you see what would be typical development. Once we're fully, our brain is fully developed, we should be able to cognitively um, control ourselves. Uh, what we know within the developmental trauma or the adverse childhood experiences individual, their pyramid is flipped. And the main thing that controls them is a need to survive. Uh, what we see now is a lot of therapeutic interventions being demonstrated as a, a way to help flip this pyramid back to where cognition is in control and we're no longer in this place of survival is in control. So early data, 1998, first studies come out. The pyramid that came out with it looks like this. Um, it's hard to find a good image of the original pyramid uh, now. This is an old scan that I've had for years. Uh, you'll see that, that um, on the right, you'll see that there's some indications that are scientific gap. We don't know why this occurs, but we know that adverse childhood experiences lead to social, emotional, and cognitive impairment. We know that that leads to the adoption of health risk behaviors. Uh, then disease, disability, and social problems, and then uh, foreshortened lifespan. Um, an individual who's experienced four or more um, adverse childhood experiences and have never actually had any kind of therapeutic intervention typically have a, a lifespan that's shorter than those that uh, had the adverse childhood experiences and had a therapeutic intervention or just didn't have um, adverse childhood experiences. So over time with pyramid, the pyramid has changed. Um, about 2015, the pyramid, as more data had been collected over that 20 year period, the, what was added was uh, the stage of disrupted neural development. Basically what was found out through research was adverse childhood experiences leads to changes in the development and function of the brain, the neurotransmitter systems, and that's more or less what leads to all of the things that occur afterwards. Um, basically, uh, Rob Ando was one of the ones that had added the um, epigenetic mechanism um, to the um, idea of adverse childhood experiences and what they do to, to an individual long-term. Um, basically, from his research and, and many others, you, you see the epigenetic mechanism or the genetic changes that occur as a result of adverse childhood experiences, and now knowing that we intergenerationally, intergenerationally transmit these um, changes within our genetics as a result of trauma and abuse. This is the newest pyramid. Uh, I was about to do a presentation in Wyoming last year, and I was checking the CDC's website to see what was, if anything had been updated. There hadn't been any updates in about a year and a half, and the newest pyramid that was released um, last fall, I believe, or late summer of last year, has more stages in it, as you can see. Um, if we believe that, uh, if we know that there's an intergenerational transmission of, of the results of adverse experiences, uh, then we know that this becomes more or less like a self-fulfilling prophecy, a cycle uh, that goes back to, you know, to the idea of social context, historical trauma, uh, and more or, less, more, more, more or less the generational embodiment of all of this. And so this pyramid has grown from five original stages to you see now many, many more. Um, to the point that um, some really good research coming out about trauma and social location and how much, um, how much more adverse childhood experiences are are actually um, more common in specific situations and social set and social settings and things like that. Um, basically, to the point that this is one of my favorite new slides. I found it um, for, through some research um, done by one of the, the the individuals that are that's actually creating a usable model based on adverse childhood experiences data and how we can actually use this information to, to treat individuals and to do preventative measures. And so the idea of we've moved from just having ACEs to a pair of ACEs, and you've got your original adverse childhood experiences, 
but that is compounded in adverse community environments. So advocacy, so if we know all of these things, if we know all of this, you know, here we've got all of this good information, we've got all this good data, we've got all of this, um, these, these specific things that are, pres you know, pointing in a specific direction of what we should do, uh, why are we not doing them? Um, why are we not um, being more of a voice for our clients? Uh, and so, you know, there's no right or wrong answer. The idea is what can we do to take this information, use it ethically, reasonably, practically apply it, and at the same time be an advocate for our client, clients. Um, basically, we know that if we don't do something, um, the brain will wire itself to um, fight or flight instead of pro-social engagement. So that's the end result of ACEs is we're wiring it to more of the survival mechanism uh, versus pro-social engagement, attachment, relationships, uh, things like that. So if we know these things, uh, what do we as a society and as a profession need to do to get this message out to be a better advocate and voice for our clients. Um, just another good slide. This is another ancient slide from um, 2001. The idea of what happens with adverse experiences. Well, basically, if your brain is going to wire to survival, your brain is going to wire to what you see on the left, the lateral tegmental circuitry, which is your avoidance mechanism. And the, the part of the brain that likes to attach and approach and be social the ventral tegmental system uh, is what's most damaged by the adverse experiences. You damage that part of the brain. Um, what's left? Your avoidance mechanism. So you avoid or push away or passively cope. So we have all the pieces. Now, how do we do anything about it? And I'll stop the presentation and, and, and say, do we have any questions? Any questions, anyone? I'm... I see a few in the chat. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? I'll make sure you get this you're you're welcome to this use it train other people you know pass it along um whatever you want to do with it <laughs> um start screaming neuroethics and say we need to know more about it we need to uh, we need to have it in our codes of ethics or have something kind of pointing towards it you know we've got we've got the competency and advocacy stuff, but at the same time, we're not um, we're, we're not staying up to date. Um, I know we have many bigger things to to do within our codes of ethics, but um, can just think about how much neuroscience research has progressed in the last twenty years, and the need to really start talking about neuroethics. We're not medical. We're not going to talk about bioethics. We need to start giving it the name that it is and give it, you know, which is neuroethics and, and, and then more or less start figuring out what does this mean to the counseling profession or to all branches of mental health, you know, not the medical part, but the, the all branches of mental health. Um, look at the resources that I included. I'll send you, like I said, this PowerPoint. Um, look at the resources um, at the end. Um, there's quite a few neuroethics institutes. One, like I said, was and showed you in the in the PowerPoint University of Pennsylvania. That was probably the first in the country. There's one big one in Canada. There's one in England, but really good research and um, and kind of the idea of what um, what we're doing with this and how we're trying to take this information and apply it to being accountable advocates, but competent accountable advocates. 
All right, everyone, just remember to fill out uh, the survey monkey to get your points by um, April 19th. I will share that again. It's the same one for each session. And Dr. H, sorry for all the oh, that's fine. Uh, technical oh. difficulties. Well, you know, it's like being in a real presentation. People stop and ask questions. You know, it's it's fine. It all, it all worked out in the end. Yes, it did. Sweet. So if you have no questions, I guess we're done. Join us Thursday for an all day of Cycle Farm. Uh, Justine and I will be doing cycle farm all day on Thursday. I wanted to ask you um, for the cycle farm if or like I have like some meetings in between there if like I know I won't be able to get the full credit but is it okay if I like kind of jump in for a bit and then maybe leave for an hour and come back? Sure do what you need to do. Okay. And we'll make that, you know, it's a huge PowerPoint and, and we'll make that available to you and, and you, you know, you'll see what you missed and can add in the information. Definitely. Okay. Thanks. What time does that start? <clears throat> I think it's nine central time. Okay. I think it's nine to three thirty and break. Well, there'll be breaks I'm sure in there, but yeah, I think it's nine. All right. I'll be there. That'll be cool. All right, and I'm going to stop recording.